And, that, and now we are uh, so pleased to have Dr. Lindue Sibanda, the Chief Executive Officer and Head of Mission at the Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network. That's why they call it FANRAPAN, That's <laughs> because it's so long. I'm there, and I am going to now turn to her so that she may introduce the members of her panel and continue this discussion. Thank Dr. Peng. Thank you. Please bear with us. I'm just waiting for our farmer panel member who is coming on stage just now. Thank you and good morning. Excellencies, laureates, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special event and panel entitled Focus on Africa, Policy and Partnerships. We hope during this session we'll be able to discuss what is it that Africa is doing? What is it that Africa can bring to the world to feed 9 billion by 2050? Is Africa on course to meet this challenge? Is the trend line looking positive? And if not, what are the gaps and how can we close these gaps? Let me take you on a bird's eye view to my Africa. Africa is the world's second largest and second most populous continent. With over one billion people as of 2013, it accounts for almost 15% of the world's population. According to UN estimates, women in Africa produce up to 90% of the food that we eat, and two out of three women are employed in agriculture. So this is indeed a special sector for Africa. Africa has a plan. The Africa plan is the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Plan which was signed off by all heads of state of all 54 African countries as far back as 2003. In this plan, Africa commits to eliminating hunger, reducing poverty and food insecurity, and enabling the expansion of exports. We talk today, 10 years on, after the CADEP declaration, where is Africa and what have we achieved? More recently, the African Union declared 2014 as the year of agriculture and food security. And that is the time we took stock in terms of what have we achieved. Under CADEP, we had committed to ensuring that for every African country, at least 10% of the national budget is devoted to agriculture. In addition to that, we wanted to ensure that this is the leading sector with a minimum of 6% per annum growth. Sadly, we're not there yet, but we are making progress. Only 13 countries have been able to meet this minimum 10% allocation, but there are success stories that we want to share today. More recently in Malabo, when we celebrated 10 years of CADEP, there was renewed commitment. And in this renewed commitment, Africa is committing to sustaining the annual sector growth of 6% per annum for agriculture. Africa is committing to establishing and strengthening inclusive public-private partnerships of at least five priority agricultural commodity value chains, which have a strong linkage to smallholder agriculture. And thirdly, Africa is committing to creating job opportunities for at least 30% of the youth in the agriculture value chains. And most important, 
Africa is committing to reducing stunting by at least 10 percent. These are tall orders, but we are sure that we are in it together and it can be done. With me this morning, we've got the best of what Africa can do. Three ministers of agriculture, ranging in experience from one year to over 20 years. We have minister from Rwanda, minister from Sierra Leone, and minister from Liberia. We also have the real people who make it happen, the farmers and private sector. And we're excited that we're joined here by Paul Schickler of DuPont Pioneer, who's been with DuPont Pioneer for over 40 years. This is a man who's seen it all, done it all, and has answers for Africa. Welcome, Paul. Next to Paul, we have Honorable Minister Geraldine Mukeshimana. She became minister in 2014. She holds a PhD in plant breeding and genetics. And prior to that, she was a coordinator of rural support program working on infrastructure and landscape transformation. Welcome to the panel. Next, we have uh, Honorable Minister Florence Chenoweth, who is the longest serving and was the first female African minister holding the portfolio of agriculture as far back as 1970. When I introduced the panelists, someone did say, I wasn't born at that time, not me. <laughs> She's a soil scientist in her first degree, but has also got a PhD on land use management, and she hails from Liberia, has worked for a long time with FAO. Next, we have Honorable Minister Dr. Joseph Sam Sese from Sierra Leone. Minister has been in office since 2007, and he boasts that he's one of the most experienced ministers in the portfolio of agriculture. He is chair, he's currently the chair of the FAO Committee on Agriculture, and he has experience in working with the United Nations. He holds a PhD in development economics. Finally, we've got a champion, a mother, a child bride, a widow, a mentor, a businesswoman. Farmer Vatican Dagnashu hails from Ethiopia in Waldia district of North Wola zone of Amara Regional State. She is our hero because she's here to share a success story from the ground. Without wasting time, we just have one hour. I just want to go to the farmer. Take us to Waldia district of North Wola zone. We want to know what is happening there and share your story of what makes you the champion who is a gold medal winner from the regional government. Over to you, my sister. I'm, thank you. I'm thankful for introducing, uh, I, I like to introduce, uh, I am well, I'm, I'm so much welcome to be here by the Gates Foundation. Hmm? English? I got married when I was 13 years old, and I have got my first baby when I was 14 years old. And then after that, my husband passed away during the Eritrea and Ethiopian War. And then I have been in a very difficult situation since I didn't have any support system. Because the lifestyle in Ethiopia, specifically for women, is very hard. But no, I committed to myself that I have to support my children by uh, engaging into agriculture. At first, I was uh, in a, a very uh, hard situation because I didn't know, uh, I didn't have any uh, support system and I didn't have enough food, uh, clothing, and all this happened for five years. And the, uh, the land that I have is only 2.1 hectare. 
Then I went to the uh, uh, agriculture uh, extension workers and agriculture experts. I started getting advice from them. Then I start producing more on teff and sorghum. I have also other uh, cr uh, crops that I am uh, producing. I'm doing this in connection with the agriculture experts and the extension workers in my community. And that helped me to transform my agriculture uh, productivity. And as a result, now I am able to uh, educate my, ch uh, my children. And the, my firstborn is a degree graduate and he is an engineer and working in Ethiopia. This commitment happened because I didn't want my children to proceed the lifestyle that I used to have. I wanted them to have a better life. And even now, my second born, he is a, a, a truck driver. And also the other children, they are still in, at school and I am supporting them. After passing all this difficult situation and I become a success and a model for many uh, Ethiopian farmers and I become a, a gold medalist in, at regional level and at uh, uh, country level. I do have so many different type of crops like orange, banana, coffee and also I am planting trees. That's why I am a food secured woman. And still, I, I like to tell you there are still so many problems in Ethiopia because we don't have a modern agriculture system and our agriculture system is labor intensive and I still using cows, uh, oxes to uh, plow it for plowing. And uh, my work time is 24 hours in a, within a day because I don't have any other alternatives. But after like, you know, supporting, uh, after uh, starting using uh, improved variety of crop plants and I become successful and I have got many yields and that enabled me like to have more uh, money. And now I have a house that I bought in the city and I am renting that and that actually contributed for more income in my life. So I have seen so many change, uh, change in my life because of I am interacting with different uh, people and also I got this experience after coming to Ethiopia, uh, after coming to this uh, The major problem that we are facing in our agriculture system is uh, there is climate change and the degradation of soil and specifically women are not empowered by the community. I wish to get so many uh, uh, power and uh, I wish the world to be a spokesperson for women in Ethiopia to be empowered and to get um, uh, many uh, support. So we don't have a like, health packaging system in our country. And we don't have a women mentors and women agriculture experts that we can work together and we don't have a, a, a women role models. I did my, uh, my own uh, initiate, I, I took my own initiative and started this development unit and started uh, teaching many women in my community. And without the extension package, without the input into the agriculture system, the improvement or the productivity of a yield will not change. <laughs> it 
if you are supporting our extension packaging system, if you are supporting our small uh, whole agriculture system, we will change more. And I really thank you very much for all your support. Ladies and gentlemen, there is the story of a champion, a woman who is making it happen, and her number one priority is to make sure children are educated and they don't go through her experience. Thank you very much. Minister Sese, you've heard the story. Sierra Leone, what are you doing for farmers like my sister here in Ethiopia? Do you have the same circumstances or you don't have any problems at all? You very well know that uh, everywhere, not only Africa, we do have problems in the agricultural sector. And for Africa in particular, let me say Sierra Leone specifically, we do have challenges in spite of the progress that we have made as a country, as has been highlighted by His Excellency the President. However, in our strive to promote the sector, we have come up with initiatives that have really improved the sector. And one of them, is to ensure that we provide an opportunity for the farmers to come together and strengthen their position in the market through the construction of the agricultural business centers. Uh, these agricultural business centers, or ABCs for short, have a multi-purpose uh, strategy. First, it is uh, a means to reduce post-harvest loss by 50%. I mean, currently in Africa, and Sierra Leone, in general, virtually half of what we produce is lost after harvest. So the agricultural business center is a, an infrastructure wherein people will store, farmers will process, store, market their produce, as well as market agricultural inputs. We channel agricultural inputs through them. So it is an input-output marketing strategy. It is a strategy to reduce post-harvest loss and also, it is an extension strategy because every agricultural business center, we are talking about five, three to five uh, farmer based organizations comprising of 25 to 30 persons. So you can imagine the outreach using the ABC to deliver extension services in a situation wherein the human resource to, outreach the, uh, to, to reach the farmers is very limited. It is also a strategy to uh, help the farmers transform from a inf very informal, as agriculture is, to a formal uh, uh, legal entities. With the agricultural business centers, we are now helping them to become legal entities like limited liability companies or cooperatives, so that they now have a legal status to be able to access whatever facilities like uh, uh, business, uh, financing, which is very difficult for them because they are not formalized. And it is also a way of uh, improving their own access to whatever facilities. So the ABC in Sierra Leone is really doing a very good job to bring farmers together, teach them, reduce post-service losses, and also transform them in many ways. This has really helped the farmers. Minister, we heard this morning His Excellency the President eloquently defending the role of the youth and telling us they are the leaders of today. And everything we do, the leaders are the youth. What is the average age of this farmer that is involved in ABC program? Well, I, I would want to say, I, don't, I cannot put finger on the average age, but I will say that about 60% of the membership of the agricultural business centers that are well over 300 to 500, in fact, constitute uh, the youth. And uh, that means they are key in the promotion of the agricultural business centers in Sierra Leone. And uh, we are changing the position, as he said. He has appointed many ministers that are youth. We used to say the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. He is saying the youth are the leaders of today. Excellent. I'm sure my sister from Uganda, the vet, will be happy that in Sierra Leone, farming is no longer a retirement job. It's for the youth and the leadership, the policymakers are being revitalized. We have more youth in cabinet. So we are yet to see very good policies. But you're not doing well on CADEP. Let's see that 10 percent. Well, I mean, uh, incidentally, I'm champion of CADEP in Africa, and uh, 
We formulated our program in 2009, signed our compact. Uh, we committed ourselves to uh, uh, allocate 10 percent, and we did very well, very close to it, very close. And I was very instrumental uh, among the ministers of agriculture in Africa to develop a document to recommit our heads of state during the, the last uh, summit. Uh, recommit them to the Maputo Declaration 2010, I mean three, which you highlighted in terms of the 10 percent, the 6 percent growth rate, undertaking the CADE process, but additionally, a new set of commitments. I mean, uh, ending hunger by 2025, giving youth employment by 30 percent, increasing interregional trade by three times the, more than the current 11 percent. These are some of the additional commitments, and they signed up to that. I think that's a great achievement for Africa. Congratulations, Sierra Leone. You've done your CADEP compact. You're on the second phase. We have a minister who chairs the FAO Committee on Agriculture. So we are watching this space. Thank you. Thank you. We move to Liberia. My sister, Honorable Minister Florence, you've been in it for many, many years. Take us to your world. What is happening in Liberia? I guess, thank you very much. I think because I have been at it for so long lies the pain that I feel seeing where we are in agriculture today. Because my third time around, I came back to an agricultural sector that was completely, completely destroyed in 2006. So we, we started from scratch bringing our farmers, our citizens back from refugee camps where they had been over 24 years, had lost any farming technique or interest, had been fed in refugee camp. So the first thing we had to bring them home. And then we had to encourage them to go back to uh, farming. It took a lot of teaching. Or, or retraining or, and a lot of grassroots help. We moved in 2006 from a position of where we were mechanizing to, even though not to a large extent or a big mechanization, but even on small farmers' field, to small farmers getting back and starting at that very rudimentary level of the hoe and cutlasses again. We have the majority of our farmers, uh, the majority of our people in the farming sector, over 70 percent, small scale, again, as I said, and among those, the majority are women. Now, to describe the Liberian farmer, she is a woman and she is around 50 years old. We have had difficulty with that rudimentary uh, level that we had to start from attracting youth or retaining youth on the farms. As we improve, we are beginning to see some returns of the youth and we are encouraging that. The government has a policy of supporting women where, who have traditionally limited access to resources of, of providing, not ensuring that not less than 30% of the resources go to these women farmers. So it's beginning to, to change. The, like, like my colleague here said, they produce over the largest percentage of, of the food, uh, and they have been uh, the greatest impacted by the Ebola. Uh, we have, they have the same difficulty, access to land. We are doing something about it. We decided to go there. Not many African countries want to tackle land tenure issue. It's a can of worms, but we are there and to ensure that we have equal access to land for small farmers. They have the challenges of access to, to, to credit. The hardest thing is getting people to think of agriculture as a business, which uh, uh, we like to think it is. And their access to markets with our poor infrastructure, everything, because it too had to be rebuilt, 
processing facilities, attracting the private sector. I'm very happy we have a private sector person on this panel because in our region, attracting the private sector to agriculture, they are not moving as fast as any of us want to see. You say that uh, land issues, land tenure is a hot potato, but you are ready with your gloves to tackle that one. How small is small? When we talk about these small holdings, we tend to generalize. When I go to Liberia, what is the standard size of a small holding uh, for a farmer? About 1.5 acres. Acres, acres, acres of land. Thank you. But you have to think of it in where we're using the slash and burn or to a large extent, and we are 100%, you know, we're in these high uh, forested areas. So de-stumping is a problem. So when they have 1.5 to 2 acres of land, a lot of it really is not planted. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me move now to Rwanda. Honorable Minister, you've been in roads, infrastructure, terracing, and we heard yesterday that really this is what we need to be looking at, infrastructure. Those were some of the last words from our pioneer, our champion, Norman Bollock, said, fix the infrastructure if you want to take it to the farmer. You've been there, now you're a minister. Bring us to your world in Rwanda. What are the challenges? What are the policies that will make it happen? Uh, thank you. In Rwanda, actually in the agricultural sector, we operate under the a strategic plan which is supposed to transform agriculture flow from a subsistence to a market lead agriculture. So during in that uh, uh, strategy, there's three pillars. The one which is aiming at uh, increasing productivity of crops and livestock. The one which is looking at research and technology generation and also the value, the value ad addition and linkage to market. So where I have been actively engaged is the infrastructure development. So I used to lead efforts to develop irrigation uh, infrastructures, but currently we are kind of successful in developing uh, hillside uh, erosion control. The reason I'm saying that is that I come from a hilly country with very small land holding. But fortunately, that land holding is private. So every single farmer has his own land and he has the title for it. So the government is trying to develop those kinds of infrastructures in uh, uh, erosion control, we end up doing what we call uh, radical terracing. We have been doing a progressive terracing, pla uh, grass planting, but that has not helped much. So recently we moved to what we call radical terracing. It's a kind of mechanical work. So you kind of divide the landscape into small plots so that you can reduce the slope up to zero or zero something, and then instead of water flowing downstream, it's entering into the soil. That's an initiative that has been successful because it sounds weird that you are investing in a private land as a government, but that's the only way we can help because whatever we do, if the soil keeps moving downstream, it's not going to help. So this approach has been kind of comprehensive. The people, men, women, uh, children, uh, youth in the age of working, they are working on developing those infrastructures. It's uh, linked to a banking system where People who are laborers on that, they are making the money, but the payment is being channeled through banks. And that money is the money that they use to buy the first round of inputs for production. And also, 
such heavy investment, you don't use, want to use it for everything. So usually we encourage people to grow high value crops on that. And uh, we have been investing also into rural roads to make sure that the tracking industry is functioning, the process, uh, processing is being done. But still, as a government, you feel like probably we are working on a production and productivity side, but probably also let's look at supporting the private sector because that's where you are encouraging people to produce, but what happened after they produce? So they need to be linked to a market, they need to be linked to value addition, but they are also, you find that there is a long way to go. Thank you very much, Minister, for unpacking the, the policy that you have developed as government and are implementing and are reaping the fruits of success from that. But we also want to congratulate you because as Rwanda, you were the first African country to sign on your CADEP compact. Declaration was 2003 and 2007, Rwanda was the first to sign. But more than that, you were the first African country to then go into second phase. So you didn't just sign and sit, you signed, implemented. What were the fruits of the first five years of CADEP? Can you bring those to this room? What did CADEP do for you? Actually, we are using a CADEP as a strategy to finance the strategic plans that we are doing. So that has been a framework where the government and all development partners we are meeting and we, as we have posted our strategic plan, that's where, that's where we develop that kind of basket funds where everyone is coming in and uh, putting funds to develop what we are developing. So what I have said for a strategic plan being uh, increasing productivity, being into research and technology development and extension services, being the value addition and the linkages to market, all of that has been supported by the CADEP one, and now we are entering into the second phase and we are really happy that we are getting our development partners on board to support. Excellent, thank you very much. Private sector, private sector, private sector, we've heard that word, it used to be a dirty word when I grew up. So now that we can talk about it comfortably, DuPont Pioneer, what are you doing for Africa? Um, thank you for the question and the opportunity. Um, you know, when we hear the other speakers and also when we think about what we've uh, talked about today and uh, also the issues of this week, um, the challenges are significant, um, very significant. Um, but at the same time, as I look at the solutions, I try and look at them in a straightforward fashion. They're not simple, but I think straightforward helps. And when I think about the solutions, it comes to um, three areas. And that's what we're focused on, and I think also many in the room are focused. The first is education, the second is partnership, and the third is making investments. So I think we've already heard those themes already. So first, um, on education. Our wonderful farmer from Ethiopia described how important education has been not only to her success in farming but also to her children. So that is clearly something that needs attention. So what are we doing at DuPont Pioneer? Uh, we've got a great program also in Ethiopia. It's a partnership with the Ethiopian government and USAID. It has a lot of components to it, uh, inputs, access to credit, but one of the components that is most important is education or extension. We're in our second year. Uh, the first year we planted 320 demonstration plots. This year, 3,200 demonstration plots, and it's all about demonstrating, showing, and transferring knowledge to the farmer. Already we've impacted 4,000 farmers in Ethiopia. Our goal is to impact 100,000. So education clearly is one part of the solution. Second part is partnership. I, 
the Ethiopian example that I just cited is clearly partnership. But I'll give you another example that uh, relates exactly to what the minister said about making agriculture a business. Uh, so we have a program in South Africa, uh, also in partnership with the Africa Farmers Association and John Deere, where we're identifying 20 farmers, but helping them be a seed producer. So not just growing the crop, but turning their uh, operation into a seed production activity, into a real business, and elevate it to that level. So I think that's um, another way to look at a partnership and also to develop the competency to run a business. And then the third thing that I mentioned, of course, is investing. And that's, I think, really what makes the difference. Uh, we heard also from the minister about investing in infrastructure, um, but also what we as a business do is invest locally. Um, in 2013, we put in place in South Africa a uh, leading research hub, and it has really two opportunities for us. One is certainly to develop products for South Africa as well as products for all of Africa. But the second is to help bring in others into our research hub, uh, academia, students, uh, government, uh, association, farmers associations, and have them learn and experience what science can do to productivity in agriculture. So again, that's what we're, we're doing. I think, I think it's sort of a, like I said, a straightforward approach to the very serious and complex problems. It is education, partnership, and investing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chita. What you are saying is you're doing for others. You're in partnerships, you're educating, you're making sure you cultivate the seed for business to grow. But we heard from Rwanda that the private sector they have there is crying for help. Who is helping you? It comes back to the partnership. Um, I, I mentioned these things that are important to us and I think important to our um, challenges that we face. Education, access, uh, turning agriculture into business. And in each one of those cases, we're doing it in partnership. So education, I mentioned USAID, uh, but also we've got a broad uh, partnership across the entire continent of Africa with 4-H to help educate two million youth across the continent over the next number of years, uh, and we're doing that in partnership. I mentioned the activity in South Africa with John Deere. Um, we have other activities where we're trying to bring students from the continent to the United States for training on science and technology. Uh, if we're really going to make a difference long term on the continent of Africa, regulatory systems and seed systems need to be created. Again, that's going to be done through partnership. Excellent. Africa, when private sector comes and says they want help, the answer is partnerships. Go find 4-H, go find John Deere, go find the helpers and partner and do business. Not just government should be the provider. We are in it together. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not want to monopolize this. I want to open up for questions from the floor. We don't have much time. If you can queue up behind the mics, I think we'll have the opportunity to pick up a couple of questions. All right. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, my name is Carly Moore and I'm a college student from North Carolina State University. And I have a question. Uh, how receptive are smallholder farmers to outside uh, influence? And how do you incorporate indigenous knowledge into the education system? Uh, specifically, the people who live there know more about it than people coming in. How do we match their indigenous knowledge with the knowledge we have from research institutions? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other question? That's a broad one for all the panelists to answer. All right. Who wants to take that one? Minister Sisse. Well, um, in Sierra Leone, we have introduced uh, a research and extension strategy of establishing innovation platforms. This, uh, uh, um, this platform brings together the researchers, the extension, the farmers, and also the private sector, as well as the civil society to determine uh, research priorities and to determine whether the technologies that are developed by research delivered by extension are creating the desired impact 
and to provide a feedback to along the line. So it's like a technology development, adoption, uh, and a feedback system along the line of the researchers, extension, the farmers, and everybody. And uh, you know, so that brings on board what the experiences of farmers as well as what researchers and extension can bring on the table. So, so let's go from the uh, public sector to the private sector again. Um, one of the pleasures that I have uh, in the private sector with uh, DuPont Pioneer is to interact with growers, with farmers. And I do that here in the United States. I do it in Rwanda. I do it in Uganda. I do it in Kenya, Thailand. It's one of the, like I said, the great pleasures that I have. But the purpose of that is to listen. I want to listen to the problems, and I want to listen to the cultural practices, because we can learn as much from, um, in the words that the student used, the indigenous locals, as what I think we can share in science knowledge. So, so it really is two ways. Excellent. We've got another question lined up. So please introduce yourself and fire. I'm Chris Wasike. I work with one of the public universities in Kenya. And my question is a very simple one. I would like to know from the panel, what is their commitment towards agricultural research? Because I, I am a firm believer that technology has to be backed by research. And looking at the smallholder farmers, how diverse they are, how is the model of research being formed in such a way that it can be able to support the smallholder system. Thank you very much, Say. I know exactly who should answer that question. Minister Geraldine, uh, you were associated with an African center of excellence, Becca, the Becca Ilri Hub in Ethiopia, where really you've got the, in, in Kenya, my apologies, state-of-the-art technologies, state-of-the-art machinery, and all the brains, and you yourself are an expert in, genet in genetics. Take us there. Have you taken that to your higher office, or that's left outside, and you're now just doing politics? Share with us. <laughs> I'm hardly integrating into doing politics, so. I have been at Baker where uh, which is a center of excellence for science and technology in Africa. So what has been, we do, we used to do, and they are still doing it for African agricultural science, it's so many, in so many ways. Most of, uh, first of, first of all, there are capacity building component, but the capacity building component is uh, educating African scientists the state of art technologies to do science. But also, these people who are there for capacity building, they bring in real questions. Real questions from the countries, from farmers, and this research is a research which is solving issues that are already in the field. That's one way of doing science for agriculture. But every country in Africa has its own research centers for agriculture. Uh, so uh, such institutions are not as strong as you would wish them to be. But they are doing their best to do research which is responding to the real world need. Thank you. So we've got a champion now for Il Rebecca Hub. You've been there, you benefited, now you're a policymaker. Take it to the world and tell them we need more investment for research and research that is to feed policy, not research for just publications. Thank you. Minister Sese, can I? Just give you 30 seconds because we've got a long queue now of uh, yes. people who want to ask questions. I just want to say that I think there is need for a, a transformation of the agricultural research system in Africa. They must move from that traditional system of looking at uh, an aspect, for example, input supply. Yes. 
they should now look at the value chain. We are approaching the agricultural value chain systems in agriculture. Uh, they have to look at imp appropriate inputs, uh, production systems, value addition, and marketing. And uh, they have to also look at agriculture as a business. What technologies can really help the farmers to do farming as a business? They themselves have to change their psyche as, as well as the farmers and taking agriculture as a business and therefore produce those technologies that will enhance and enable the farmers to do farming as a business. I to emphasize that more. The Malabo Declaration says prioritize five commodity value chains. Researchers latch on to those and provide support. Government is ready. Can I get the questions? Quick name and question, and uh, my panel will write those down, and we just have 10 minutes to respond. Thank you. Over to you. Sure, great. We're so lucky and privileged to have an actual small farmer with us here from Ethiopia. So I would like to hear her answer to the previous question about matching her own indigenous knowledge of farming with extension services, outside expert advice, and specifically how it helped her increase, if she could give some examples of how it helped her increase her product productivity and yields and income. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Hi, um, I'm Rose Piccolo from University of Minnesota. We heard earlier about the gender gap in education and agricultural development. And I'm curious what sorts of uh, efforts have been made in your respective countries and the DuPont partnership to address this issue. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Matthew Blair, and uh, I have a question both for the ministers and uh, Pioneer in terms of diversification and uh, uh, research on other crops other than the top four that we heard about in the morning from the Gates Foundation representative. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sure our farmer will also talk about that in terms of what are the crops rather than the top four. Next question, please. My question was, how do you translate science that already known into action? Thank you. Brief and to the point. Take it to the people. Science into action. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mr. Karl Mustafa from the Global Agriculture Food Security Program, and I'm pleased that this program has projects both in Sierra Leone and uh, Rwanda. Uh, my question to the ministers is that uh, the farmer organizations, the smallholder farmer organizations, access to finance, access to capacity building are serious challenges. How are you trying to ensure that these farmer, smallholder farmer organizations not only have access to these uh, credit and capacity, but it's sustainable and they are able to uh, leverage the private sector? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Last question. Hello, I'm Charlie Mitchell. I'm a student from the Global Youth Institute. And I was wondering, how are you getting this 21st century technology to the farmers? Thank you. Over to the panel. I'd like to start with the farmer. My sister, we've got a challenge. We know we've got our own indigenous knowledge, which had sustained you, and now we have New knowledge, the science-driven knowledge. How are you working together? Are they telling you to forget about the old and just latch on to the new? Or you are in your way able to integrate the two and make it work for you? Bring us to your world. I have uh, told you already what I have become successful before, but you know, I, I used to have only 2.1 uh, hectare of land, and I didn't have any success when I was using traditional agriculture practice system. But when the extension uh, package came to in our uh, area, and they uh, showed us, they demonstrated to us how to use fertilizer, how to select, uh, to, to use selected varieties, and how to use compost. And I learned that through them. Before, I used to uh, produce only from 10 uh, to 15 uh, kilograms of teff per uh, that hectare. 
But after that, I start using uh, compost and fertilizer and also um, uh, making a, a line, uh, line cultivation. I uh, started producing uh, my, my plants online and that increased my productivity. Then uh, this success brought for me to be recognized by Oxfam, Oxfam America and they uh, took me to Addis and they introduced me different uh, type of uh, uh, agriculture uh, packaging, a modern agriculture system. And that helped me to double my output and as a result I am I have I become more successful, and that helped me to be to come here uh, in front of you. And even if in, in my country I do have a lot of uh, problem, and even if the government is teaching us, and uh, we do have problem with water, and uh, what I did is I started uh, collecting water because there is no rain, and I, by using that collected water, I start uh, using, uh, uh, planting my trees. And that came through the extension package. And so this uh, extension package helped me to, to go there. And that education helped me to be, become more empowered. And that demonstration helped me to become more successful. For example, uh, uh, selected a variety of seeds. That uh, selected variety of seeds are not accessible for majority of us. And uh, specifically, the women uh, farmers are undermined. But no, even there is uh, uh, women violence for us. And all these are. Uh, try to be eradicated by the support of uh, our uh, government, but that our government is not wholly equipped with or like to eradicate all the problem. And that is why the Oxfam, uh, the Oxfam and the package helping me to change and become a role model. So I like to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for helping me for uh, all these changes. You can't have it any better. This is a farmer who has embraced technology and it's working for her and she's integrating that with her indigenous knowledge. Honorable ministers, in my eight to five job, I'm told always have a one minute elevator speech. I want to turn that to you now. One minute elevator speech to respond to all the questions because I want us to be on time. In a nutshell, we've asked questions. What are your answers in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Rwanda, then private sector? Let me start with private sector. You always have a one minute elevator speech. I'll make yours 30 seconds. Okay, and I'll specifically address the one question about uh, other crops. Um, which is a challenge because um, research, as the discussion has had, is expensive. Um, but in it, to enable other crops, it comes back to partnership. So my example is sorghum. Sorghum is not a commercial crop for DuPont Pioneer in Africa. But what we've done is, go, through partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Howard Buffett Foundation, brought biofortified sorghum as a staple crop through research, technology collaboration, now working through regulatory systems to enable that opportunity to be in front of smallholder farmers. My sister Florence from Bokoe in the audience will be excited to hear that. She asked she a question That's yesterday. Correct. Rwanda, one minute elevator response. Yeah, I want to respond to the question about the gender gap and the science technology into action. The gender gap is still a big issue. And uh, most of the women in Africa are into production. That's the bottom of the chain. So we need to get them in higher level. And that's a challenge that all of us we are facing to get them from the production to the other sides of the chain. The science and technology into action, that is requiring partnership. By generating data and science 
it's one thing, but taking it down where it is supposed to be, it's another thing. So all of us, we need to work together to make sure that we are delivering the, message, the right message to where it is meant to be. Excellent, thank you very much. Exactly one minute. Over to Liberia. Well, very quickly on the gender gap, we have a woman as president, and she is also a farmer. So when it comes to agriculture, we don't have too much problem in narrowing that gap. On the diversification, we do push uh, for that because we're trying to get our people to stray away from uh, one step of food. Not easy, but they're making good progress. How do we translate uh, the science? We have found that the easiest way is to involve uh, the small farmers right from the start. Uh, we involve them by training them as trainers. So they, they line, they appreciate things, and then they take it, help us spread it uh, uh, to, to other farmers. And, and farmers are, by, are not stupid. They see the science working, and they see money in what it is leading to, they will adapt it. If it means just putting their money in the hole and not, and not uh, making money from it, they simply let it pass. I just didn't want to close, let you forget that Liberia became number seven uh, on the continent for, for signing the CADA. And we have also we, uh, gotten our, our GAPS funding. That means that we're close to the end of, of CADAP 1, and we will go on to CADAP 2. Congratulations, Liberia. Sierra Leone, one minute elevator response. Well, um, I would want to talk about uh, how do you, would the smallholders leverage uh, support from the large scale investments? Incidentally, in Sierra Leone since 2008, I was able to pass through cabinet uh, a policy on promoting large scale investments in agriculture through a, a package of incentives. And that has really attracted a lot of uh, uh, private sector investment, especially foreign direct investment in Sierra Leone. And uh, to create more opportunities, we are trying now to integrate the smallholders into these large scale investments for them, to, the smallholders, to practice agriculture as a business through forms of outgrower schemes. Uh, we are saying that if you are taking land, for your production, it can only be 60 to 70 percent. The balance you have to contract out to smallholders, give them a package of support for them to also supply you uh, their produce and so forth. And that is, that is one of the strategies. Excellent. So our ministers do do one minute elevator responses. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope in this session we've been able to take you to Africa, showcase that Africa has a plan through CADAP showcase that it's not just a plan on paper, but there has been implementation. There are success stories. Africa is moving into second phase CADEP. And what is key is the partnerships and African private sector is up for the game for the international community. And what they want is partnerships to make things happen. Thank you to our farmer who's grounded the conversation. Thank you to private sector who showcased that they are in Africa, they are working with partners, and government is providing the conducive environment. And thank you to our eloquent ministers who are scientists, development economists, showing that Africa is taking research to policy and making sure there is a conducive environment for us to feed the Africa of today and the Africa of 2050. Thank you very much. And, and thank you. Thank you to Dr. Lindaway Sabanda for a superb job of moderating uh, this panel and keeping it focused and on time. So let's have a round of applause for her. Thank you. Thank you.